You're listening to the Catholic Accent Podcast. In this podcast, we discuss the acts and miracles that Jesus performed that stunned his disciples. I'm Jordan Wyko, along with Father Andrew Hamilton and Father Christopher Pujol. Jordan, what are we talking about today? Today's topic is the prediction of the passion. Now, Jesus tells his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and be killed. So what do you think they were thinking? If you were one of Jesus' disciples, what, what would your reaction have been to this news? Oh, Why? Or to be a little selfish, I'd think, ooh, maybe I shouldn't go along. (laughs) I'm going to sit this one out. Yeah, I'll I'll meet you back in Nazareth. I'll I'll wait. (laughs) But so where are they at, Jordan? You know? No, you tell me. All right. Why don't you set the stage a little bit? That sounds good. Okay. We've been doing that four episodes in a row now. (laughs) Caesarea Philippi. Think of it. Caesar Philip. Philip the Tetrarch names it after Caesar, of course, which is the Roman emperor. So it's not a Jewish town. That's important to know. Mm -hmm. It's a pagan city and so forth, and it's above Nazareth. Now, talking about disciples being stunned or the apostles following Jesus, this was a place that was known as a pagan worship site of the god Pan, specifically, of uh, of a god, goddess of fertility for the pagans. And so immediately the disciples would have said to themselves, why are we going to Caesarea Philippi? So much so that it was common that there was a a large underground uh, cave there that they would actually sacrifice to the god Pan for a healthy harvest and other things and fertility and so on. And what they would do is they would actually throw first a goat or a lamb into this large cave And then, depending upon what came out of the cave blood or whatnot, they would accept and see that maybe God, the God Pawn, had accepted this sacrifice or Or not. Or rejected it. Right. And so if it was a rejection of the sacrifice, the next thing that they turned to, not another animal, but a child or a virgin Mm -hmm. that they would then throw into the cave and sacrifice to the God Pawn. So this was a place that was known to be terrible. Jewish people would not have wanted to go there, so the disciples probably were thinking, what in the world are, are we, we doing, doing here in Caesarea Philippi? Yeah. Turn around, we shouldn't be passing through. It's like driving through those parts of town. You're like, ooh, maybe I shouldn't be here right now. And yeah. that had to be what they were thinking. This is not my area. And Jesus is just like, trust me, it'll all be okay. But then he begins to explain to them where they're going and why. And that's what makes them all stop in their tracks. And I think bringing up from a a previous episode what Father Chris had said about Peter, right? When he goes out Mm -hmm. onto the water, Peter's always this one that wants to jump ahead of Jesus, and he's always kind of putting his foot in his mouth. And so this is another instance where Peter does something really good immediately before this prediction, and then he gets rebuked by Jesus in in this passage. So Jesus asks all of the apostles, who do they say that I am? Some say Elijah and the prophet or Moses and so on. But what does Peter say? You're the Lord. You're the Son of God. Son of the living God, right? And so he proclaims him to be the Messiah, the one that will die for their sins. Mm -hmm. And so Jesus says then to Peter, well, he changes his name Simon Peter, just Peter, you are the rock on which the church shall rest. The gates of hell will not prevail against the church. So he's told to be good and changes his name. Everything's really grand and so forth. And then Jesus says, I'm going to Jerusalem to die. And And Peter says, God forbid it. God's saying it. All right. He's an obstacle. And everything stops. And that's when Jesus, you can almost hear him stop like that footprint, just stop in the sand, a little bit of dust, spins around, and he says, get behind me, Satan. You're an obstacle to me. And Peter had to be shaken in his boots. Now, I don't want to undo what Father Chris just said here, but this is the way I'm going to say it was explained to me in Caesarea Philippi. Normally, the guides look up at the big rock face, the cliff. So it makes sense whenever Jesus Mm -hmm. says, you are the rock, because there's a bunch of big rock face there. But that cave that we were talking about earlier Mm -hmm. would be probably behind Jesus as he's explaining maybe this to Peter and them. How can Jesus still build his church on Peter when he calls him Satan? Well, he's still he's he's basically in that moment the way that Peter is actually acting is a stumbling block to the mission of God, in which that he's acting like how Satan would do so. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Satan accuses, and then we have another word in Greek, diabolos, which is we get the word devil, devil from, and that means to cast apart. And so, in some sense, what the devil does to us is casts us apart from the mission of God, apart from God, and then he creates a stumbling block between us 
and God. salvation. And so what Peter's doing here is trying to keep God back from the redemptive work that he's come to do. So literally when he says, get behind me, Satan, he's telling him to go to where? To literally the gates of the netherworld, to hell, the place where they sacrifice children, children and, animals. and virgins and everything to a false god. And there was a belief in the ancient world that kind of spirits would rise up through these caves in the pagan world and then come to dwell on the earth. Did you visit that cave? Yeah, you can look down into it. You can't go the whole way. And okay. there's niches built into the, the rock cliff that you could see that was like at one point a temple. And then Caesarea Philippi, the town would be up on Above top it. of the hill. That's where so often in Christian art and and story that we see heaven above, hell below. There's always that that space of hell beneath. And this won't be the last time that Peter stumbles and falls and tries to not do the will of God. We'll see Peter deny the, our Lord three times still. So it's almost the continuous conversion of humanity to get a grasp on what God's doing. And I mean, even today, 2,000 years later, here we are still talking about it. This is a good point, though, which conversion isn't just like one and done. And now you're perfect and you're on like exactly the, the narrow path and you never want to stray from it and all these other things, right? Conversion has to happen over time, just like habits. If we build a bad habit, it takes a while to get out of it, even if we know that we need to, to end it. And so we might revert or fall into these things as we're still trending upwards, mm -hmm. right? So hopefully that's the arc of our salvation, but that doesn't mean that we're not going to have gullies or valleys in that. And you see that in the life of Peter, right? Mm -hmm. And an important question for us, too, to ask ourselves, who do we think God is? Because he usually breaks outside of our own barriers that we try to box him in, and that he can work in ways that we don't foresee and work in extraordinary ways. And that's always important for us in our faith, is to see that like we can't exactly know all of God, right? He's so much infinitely greater than us. We're looking from inside the box at everything, and he's outside of the box and seeing it in its full aspect. And so think about the disciples. A lot of the times in ancient Jewish culture, they thought that there was going to be some great religious leader that would be a military leader even that would come and that would overthrow the Romans who were oppressing them. And conquer the world. Right. And Jesus, that's not his mission. He's not here to be a political Messiah, but rather the one true Messiah who writes humanity with God, not just in this world, but into the next. And so that's an important part that here you see that Peter kind of has this false notion of who Jesus is supposed to be. He's still thinking that he's going to overthrow everything and mm -hmm. that he's going to live and reign gloriously on the earth and be robed in purple and have a crown. And then what do we see in his passion? He is robed in purple, but he's mocked and crowned with thorns. Crown, yeah. Yeah. So we talked a lot about Peter, but how do you think the other disciples were feeling when Jesus you know, referred to Peter as Satan? It would be like, ouch. <laughs> Maybe didn't Burn. say much yeah. Oh, you can almost hear James and John like thinking, oh, now's our chance to step forward, mm. you know, and take control. Because we see where their mother's like, oh, we want, I want my sons on your right and your left. I think that we have to think that there would have been some rivalry. And we get oh, that yeah. from the scriptures from that passage you're just saying. So some of them might have thought like, hey, serves them right. You know, because Peter's always the one that's like kind of set out front. And sometimes we have this in our own life where it's like, okay, I'm just as competent as Peter. Why am I not the guy called to be the rock? Why am I not the one that Jesus is putting at the, as the premier or the, the primacy? And uh, I think in that, it would have been a time where they could have taken it as like a, I feel bad for Peter, and so like we're going to console him, or other apostles might have been Pushing like... forward, yeah. Yeah. They, they in in their human reality, yeah. And plus, I think too, all of them had to be thinking, we can't save ourselves. Humanity can't save humanity. And so as they made their way to Jerusalem, and when they hear this, I'm sure a majority of them thought, this is true. It's coming. We've seen the miracles. We've seen the encounters. Like He knows what he's talking about. Have you ever uh, maybe been in a class where somebody asks a question, and you're like, I know the answer, but I don't want to be wrong? <laughs> yeah, That's what I think all of the time. immediately before this passage with the prediction, which is like, Peter says, like, because he usually just puts his foot in his mouth anyway, so he might as well just throw it out there to see if it's right. You are Christ, the Son of the living God, and he gets it right. But I think a lot of the other apostles around him are probably like, dang, I knew that. You know, I was, I I was going to say it, too. right, yeah. Despite, so, Father Chris, you have this friend, Liz Lev, yeah. and... Uh, in her, we did a video with her, and mm -hmm. she says that you know we're all like Judas. We are we're all sinners. We all you know do things like Judas. But I don't know. You're talking about Peter, and I feel like I'm Peter. I'm always putting my foot in my mouth. And well, see the difference between Peter and Judas, right? Mm -hmm. 
Peter recognizes when he makes a mistake, and he seeks oh. to right it, and he seeks forgiveness. Judas, when he realized what he did, despaired. And he is, in his pride, he could not ask the Lord to forgive him. Judas and Peter, in some sense, commit some of the same types of sins, not the same sin, but Denial they both betrayed Lord. our Lord, and they both denied God. I love there's the image of the rooster. Yeah. So there's a church in um, Jerusalem, St. Peter and Galilee can too, St. Peter the rooster, but he denies the Lord after hearing the cock crow or the rooster crow three times. Likewise, on an old Irish penal cross, so it's mm-hmm. a cross that was carried by Catholics in Ireland during the Reformation times of the English, and you weren't allowed to show outward signs of religiosity, Catholicism. There's at the bottom of it, there's a little rooster, but it has a twofold meaning: one for Peter's denial, mm-hmm. but then on the opposite, there was a legendary story that Judas, when he went home, his wife was cooking a rooster Mm -hmm. in a pan, basically. And he was all worried about Jesus coming back and getting in trouble with the wrath of God and so forth. And his wife said to him, Jesus has as much chance of resurrecting and coming back as this rooster does coming back to life in this pan or this pot. And then what happens? The rooster comes back to life and then Judas despairs. But the same symbol for both of them, different reactions. Despair versus asking contrition, forgiveness, righting your sins. And the rooster is a great Christian symbol because also many people place a little rooster in their nativity sets because when the cock crows, it's always at dawn, right? Hopefully. Sometimes you hear roosters around here, they're a little confused. But what happens at dawn? Christ is also born. We celebrate the birth of our Lord with the announcement. The sun rises. Yeah, exactly. And so the rooster also announces not only his betrayal and the beginning of the passion, but his birth. And so it's taking the wood of the manger to the wood of the cross, and all of this is becoming encompassed in the Constantinian um, Basilica of St. Peter's prior to the the current Basilica. um, The great windmill that was on top of it, the steeple, was a massive rooster. And it was to remind both the people as pilgrims coming of Peter's denial, who is now enshrined in this basilica, but it's also to remind us of the times that we deny him, when we hear him, and yet we continue to do our will rather than his. And that's where the conditions of discipleship are set forward. So Jesus tells his disciples that the condition for discipleship is to deny oneself and take their own crosses and follow him. So how do we live out that discipleship today? I find it in my own life, the thing that I really don't want to do is probably the thing I should do. Yep. And I think anyone who has ever trained for like an athletic event, you're not just going to go and run the 100-meter dash because you want it, right? Right. You have to prepare and get ready. And that's the same in our lives, in our spiritual lives, that to do something worthwhile, it takes time, it takes effort, and we have to deny ourselves. You know, instead of going out for a big fancy dinner, we need to deny ourselves so that we can get up early and get our workout in or get extra study in. It's part of the human condition that we can't have everything we want. And that's the problem that we face so often today, that everything must be instant and totally gratifying. If it's not, we just go for more and more and more and more. Have your cake and eat it too. Mm -hmm. How do you think we should be amazed today uh, that Jesus follows through this prediction and he goes to Jerusalem and dies for our salvation, because I would kind of be like Peter and be like, why are you doing this? I think that we could be caught up that like Jesus is God, so therefore like he just does it. Almost like a automaton, like he's Mm -hmm. a robot just doing the Father's will. We have to remember that he's fully God and fully man, and so that there's a, a human and a divine will there. No human being wants to go and be crucified. So I think I'm amazed at the fact of Jesus following through on these things that he said that he would do. And I mean, we see Jesus, he's filled with trepidation in the garden, you know, to the point where he's so scared that he's sweating blood. And scientists have been studying this, and it's a true phenomenon that when you're faced with such stress, such anxiety, and such a visceral reality that's coming your way, your capillaries will literally burst in your skin. And so when we hear about Jesus sweating blood, he was to the point that no person wants to ever find themselves. And that was just the beginning. And what he do? He cried out, Lord, 
take this cup away from me, but if it's your will, I'll continue to do it. And he continues to go forward. And I think what's stunning is when we take a moment and pause and think that God himself became man. Yes, the incarnation is absolutely stunning. But that God himself would die for creatures so that we could be restored back to him in communion. That's just, for me, that's what changes everything Mm -hmm. when you look at the church. So often people, well, how could you stay in that church? It seems so irrelevant. Well, it's not. When we see what God has done and what he's left us in his sacraments and in his church, that changes everything. Thanks for listening to the Catholic Accent Podcast. Don't forget to follow, like, and subscribe to our show.